Tonight on KQED Newsroom, Bay Area Congresswoman Jackie Speer weighs in on the latest news from Washington. Facebook under fire following a massive data breach and growing questions about whether the company has done enough to protect user privacy. Plus, PBS NewsHour anchor Judy Woodruff on the role of media in today's political environment. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with the White House shakeup and intensifying concerns over data manipulation. Yesterday, the House Intelligence Committee voted to release the Republican majority report on its Russia investigation. That report found no evidence of collusion during the 2016 elections. Democrats contend the committee overlooked most links between President Trump's campaign and Moscow. They say there were dozens of contacts between members of the Trump campaign and Russian-linked operatives. To discuss all of this now, I'm joined by Congresswoman Jackie Spear of San Mateo County. Congresswoman, nice to have you back. Great to be with you. We do want to talk to you about the Russia investigation, but first of all, there's been a lot of back and forth about the budget. President Trump tweeted uh, earlier today that he might veto the $1.3 trillion spending plan. There are reports now that he may sign it after all. What do you make of all this back and forth? Well, I refer to them as unsupervised tweets because oftentimes early in the morning after watching Fox, he will tweet and then his staff will come rushing in to explain to him how government works. I don't think he had any um, understanding of what happens um, and how the government shuts down, how li literally everyone has to leave, the parks close, uh, the social security checks don't go out. And, and I think, you know, he was given a lesson. Mm. You didn't even support the House version of the spending bill in the first place. Why not? You know, I could give you a list of probably 10 or 15 elements. First of all, the defense budget was increased by $58 billion. Meanwhile, our veterans um, were given chump chains. Um, the DACA kids were supposed to be uh, protected. They are not, and yet the president get, did get uh, a couple billion dollars for his wall. Um, I objected to the process. It was 2,400 pages long. It was filed on at 8 o'clock the night before, and we voted on it at 11, 12 o'clock the next and day. And there, there was really nothing there addressing sexual assault or, or sexual harassment so in sexual Congress as well. I know that's an, an issue that you've been working on. Uh, there was hopes that we would take the sexual harassment legislation that passed the House bipartisan, my bill, Me Too Congress Act, um, and through negotiations, uh, it was not successful in getting included in the omnibus. So my hope is, is that we're going to take it up um, and go to conference. So the Senate will take it up. The House has already passed. It'll go to conference and, and we'll get it on the books before the end of the year. Okay. I also wanted to talk to you about some high profile departures this week. Uh, General H.R. McMaster is now out as national security advisor. He's going to be replaced by former UN ambassador John Bolton. Um, he has been described as a hawk among hawks. Uh, what does this change mean for American foreign policy? I think everyone should take a sedative. Um, mm. I really think that it's going to require us to calm down and then become very vigilant because John Bolton, uh, along with Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, are responsible for taking our country into the longest war in our history, and that is the Iraq War, 15 years. Um, we've spent over $3 trillion there. That's $24,000 for every household in this country. And what do we have to show for it? Um, ISIS, Syria, Yazidis and uh, Middle Eastern Christians being um, discriminated against and killed. So uh, I just hope and pray that we are in a position where we can forestall what could be a very aggressive stance taken by the president. And what does that aggressive stance mean for our relations with North Korea? Are you concerned that we may come closer to war with North Korea? Because uh, Mr. Bolton has said in the past that he, he supports the idea of preemptive strikes against North Korea. He's not big on negotiations. In fact, he's kind of, uh, you know, um, ridiculed South Korea for being too soft. So he has a fatal flaw. Uh, all negotiations in the end are the way you settle wars. I mean, you have to use diplomacy. And when you're now dealing with circumstances around the world where so many countries do have nuclear uh, weapons, uh, 
we can't uh, have mutually uh, agreed to destruction, which is what would conceivably happen if we engage in a nuclear war with North Korea. So uh, it should have started differently. It should have started with lower level but senior persons within our State Department negotiating with North Korea. That hasn't happened. We're going directly to the president and Kim Jong-un. And then we'll have to see. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll he, what, what Kim wants is he wants identification as being a world power. Mm -hmm. And by meeting with the president, he's getting that. The question is, what are we going to get? And I don't think in the end we're going to get very much. All right, I have to move on to Russia now. Uh, you sit on the House Intelligence Committee. The panel voted along uh, this week along party lines to release uh, the majority report by Republicans. It finds no evidence of collusion between Russia and President Trump. Um, it also, you know, effectively ended the Russia investigation. Uh, you and other Democrats on the committee disagree. Why? Well, first of all, it wasn't just whether there was collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. It was to look into the Russian meddling. How much had the CIA and our intelligence community known about it before and not um, taken steps? Uh, what are we doing about the election machines in this country? How do we make sure they're fail safe and can't be hacked into? Um, most of those issues weren't discussed. Um, social media and the role it played, all of that never really saw the light of day. They went through the motions, uh, but in the end, uh, they did not subpoena documents when persons showed up for their interviews without providing any documentation. Um, they've refused 30 additional witnesses that we want to um, have come testify. We just had a whistleblower from Cambridge Anal Analytica that came forward and said that they were manipulating all of this information. Again, you have- Chris Wiley? This is Christopher Wiley, mm -hmm. and he has now agreed to come and meet with the minority members of the committee. Do you think social media companies like Facebook and Twitter should be regulated? I do think they should be regulated. I do not think they're just benign platforms. Um, the American public that engages um, in Facebook, that has a Facebook page, needs to recognize that they are not the customer, they are actually the product. And the customer to Facebook is the advertiser. So we need to have a better sense of um, what information is being shared. And we should not allow, I think, uh, for our very personal information to be used without our knowledge, certainly, and that we should have an opportunity to opt out. We should probably have a, a subscription format for Facebook, and if they are not inclined to offer that, maybe there needs to be another startup created to do that. Jackie Spear, Congresswoman of San Mateo County, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Turning to tech now, Facebook is facing backlash again for failing to prevent a massive data breach. A British consulting firm hired by the Trump campaign, Cambridge Analytica, reportedly harvested personal information from 50 million Facebook users without their consent. After days of silence, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg responded to the growing scandal. In a blog post and in interviews, Zuckerberg said Facebook will take new security measures and restrict access to some user data by third-party apps. Meanwhile, some lawmakers want Zuckerberg to testify before Congress. And there's now a social media campaign urging users to delete their Facebook accounts. Joining me now with more on this are KQED Silicon Valley Bureau Chief Tanya Mosley. Market Watch tech editor and San Francisco bureau chief Jeremy Owens and Electronic Frontier Foundation researcher Jenny Gephardt. Welcome to you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, there are so many issues here. Trust, regulation, data privacy, how Facebook is responding. We'll get to all of that. But Tanya, I have to ask you, first of all, l lay out the scene here for us because the misuse of data involving Cambridge Analytica uh, happened in 2015. When did Facebook know about it and why did it not notify users who were affected earlier? So Facebook received word that Cambridge Analytica had this data around that time in 2015 and they went to them and said, uh, please, you need to destroy this. And Cambridge Analytica said, yes, we will do that. And they actually gave them an agreement saying that they would do that. Uh, from that point, I want to tell you, though, they found out about it from 
reporters from The Guardian, a, a reporter there as well as another publication, notified Facebook that this was a possibility and that this was happening. Uh, I think the million dollar question is why they didn't notify the public until now. We received word before The New York Times published its piece um, about all of this that Facebook was going to deny Cambridge Analytica um, on their platform and they rec we received that in uh, a Facebook post as well as on their newsroom uh, blog as well. So that's the big question is why we didn't know about this sooner. And what do you think the answer is? I mean, it, it, were they wanted to protect their profits or what do you think happened here? Yeah, I think for me, um, from where I sit, it's hard to kind of dig into the internal workings of Facebook in 2015. Um, what's really clear to me, um, particularly in Zuckerberg's statement recently that he made on Facebook, was that I think Facebook is still not taking responsibility for the fact that not only do they not notify users when it would have been appropriate to do so before, um, it was really too little too late, um, but also they didn't really follow through on ensuring that Cambridge Analytica was following their policies around not storing and not retaining that critical user data. And, and Jeremy, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction to this segment, is that uh, Mark Zuckerberg finally spoke out after several days of silence, mm -hmm. um, and he posted a statement on Facebook, of course. Uh, what, what did he say about this exactly, and what are the fixes he's proposing? Well, he went through a timeline of everything they did um, and everything that happened, and then he suggested three fixes. And one is that they're going to stop any access and, and do an audit of old data. You know, this is 2015 we're talking about, and even prior to that, I mean, they had made the rule that this cannot be done anymore. But they did not go back and double check that all these apps and, and developers had actually destroyed the data. And what they see in Cambridge is we asked them if they destroyed the data. They said yes. How many other apps did that go through? And so now they're going to go back and audit all of those apps and attempt to keep that from happening in the future. And, and do the fixes that, that Zuckerberg laid out, do they go far enough, Jenny, in protecting data privacy and, and, and people's profiles, do you think? Absolutely not. Um, I think they're a good start, but they absolutely do not go far enough. Um, and one of the main reasons, I think, my biggest problem with his statement and the fixes proposed at this point, with promises that there will be more to come, um, is that Zuckerberg is asking us to trust Facebook when this whole Cambridge Analytica scandal has shown us that we cannot. Users cannot trust Facebook to handle their data, data appropriately, cannot trust Facebook to deliver them reliable information. Uh, what we need is not trust, we need transparency, we need accountability, and I think that one form that could take is independent audits. I want audits by a party that is not beholden or accountable to Facebook, but is accountable to users and to their privacy rights. One of the challenges, though, around going back to prior to before 2015 to those third party apps is that there's still no way, even with an audit, I mean, that we can think mm -hmm. of and experts who have much more brilliant minds than us, mm -hmm. that you can go back in that data and actually see all of the ways that it was used and all of the different parts and where it went. Like that train has left the station. It's already out there. And um, now we're at a point where we're looking to the future on exactly how from this point forward Facebook is going to operate while they're still looking backwards and trying to figure out how they're going to fix the mistakes that happened in the past. And as I read uh, Mark Zuckerberg's post on Facebook, you know, describing the situation and what Facebook plans to do about it, the one gaping omission was that he never really explained how the economic model for Facebook works. I mean, there was little transparency there. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I mean, how Facebook works, how it makes money is that is that the users are the products. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it is the product that is selling to advertisers and developers to make money. So um, that user data helps advertisers target and better target their customers. Lou, I think what's really interesting about what you're saying is that so many people are learning this for the first time. Precisely. Those who yeah. have reported on Facebook know about it, and we're still learning more about it, but the average user had no idea that this is how the model worked. And so a big part of this is educating the public, along with there's already been skepticism around the platform for various different reasons. Of course, after the election, that became a huge issue when people learned about the Russian meddling. And then there's been overall a sense of fatigue as we've been reassessing our relationship with technology. I want to tell you, my grandmother called me last night and said, are you going to stay on Facebook? She's 93 <laughs> years old. Are you going to stay on Facebook? Because I still want to be able to read what you have to say. Um, 
But explaining to her those details on how Facebook works, it's difficult, even if you have a deep understanding of it. And so for someone yeah. who doesn't, yeah. it's, it's really impossible. Yeah, a general rule of thumb is that if you're getting a service for free, you're the product. That's right. yeah. I mean, any service you're getting on your phone for free, they are selling advertisements uh, based on you, or they're selling your data, or anything else they can to use your usage of that to make money. So mm -hmm. can that business model then coexist with data privacy? Well, we're going to see. Uh, <laughs> Europe's about to pass or about to install a very new and restrictive data privacy regulation in May. And all of these companies are going to have to change how they operate in Europe to align themselves with that. And, and that's a big problem with this is that we don't have that type of regulation in the U.S. We talked about um, Facebook not telling people that they, well, there's no regulation mm -hmm. that they have to. Right now in Europe, there will be. And so we'll be able to see, does that hurt their profits and revenues in Europe? And what could be the effect overall? And we've also got the 2018 midterm elections uh, approaching, right? And, and um, in a New York Times interview responding to this crisis, Mark Zuckerberg revealed something that was new, that ahead of last year's special Senate election in Alabama, that Facebook detected a, quote, significant number of Macedonian fake accounts um, intended to spread fake news, um, and, and Facebook dis, did disable them. But, but the question then becomes, as governments become more sophisticated, Russia and other governments, how, how does Facebook stay ahead of that, or can it? I think that is another kind of question of the moment. The reason this is such a watershed moment is indeed because users are waking up to all the ways that this platform can be abused, and in particular how their information can be co-opted and their attention manipulated to serve that kind of abuse that has huge impacts on our democracy. Um, I think that uh, to, to stay ahead of that as far as delivering reliable information in terms of election and politics, um, one, Facebook, ha Facebook has to figure out um, how to deliver a, a more trustworthy stream of information that is not hidden behind a black boxed algorithm into which we have no transparency or control. Um, and I think until then, I would not recommend that users get all of their political or election information from the single source that is Facebook. So then what can users do to keep their information fa safe on Facebook if they decide to stay? Yeah, I think I generally approach it from two uh, angles. One is thinking about the type of information you're sharing, and another is thinking about where it can possibly go. But I think those angles of what users have agency over only go so far. That applies to, I think, active sharing. You know, I want to share this picture, and I want to share it only with my friends. That's when those privacy settings have real meaning. But when that information is being taken from you, when you have no knowledge, no agency, no consent or informed consent in it, that's not something that privacy settings or individual actions can fix. That is a huge collective privacy harm um, that is Facebook's job to prevent. And it goes way beyond Facebook. I mean, if you look back exactly. at Equifax and all of the data that's out there for us, I mean, just this week, Orbit's lost a bunch of data that was also old. And, and as we move along, we're going to see a lot of these old caches of data that are vulnerable, that people can go into. And, and that's going to be an issue moving forward for a, a long time, is that all of this information on us is sitting out there and vulnerable. And it's not a question, of, you know, strictly for what Facebook is going to do, but what are we going to do as a people? What are we, is our government going to do to try to protect us from anybody who wants to get to this data. Tanya, I know you've been talking to Facebook employees. How are they reacting? Well, insiders inside of the company, um, off the record, have been saying that they have known about these issues for quite some time, but um, they felt that the uh, higher ups have not been listening um, really to the point of making true change. And so it has taken something like this to really blow the lid from the outside to have the internal dialogue about it. All right, thank you all. Tanya Mosley, Jeremy Owens, and also Jenny Gephardt. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And now a journalist who should be very familiar to our PBS audience, Judy Woodruff, the anchor of PBS NewsHour. In 2013, she and the late Gwen Ifill made history when they became the nation's first all-women network news anchor team. This week it was announced Woodruff will now officially be the show's sole anchor. I sat down with Judy Woodruff recently when she visited the Bay Area and reflected on her journalism career. 
Judy Woodruff, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here, Twee. It's always wonderful to come back to San Francisco and to see KQED. You know, you've been covering Washington since 1977 when President Jimmy Carter was in office. You've seen many administrations. How would you assess the political climate today compared to what you've seen? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly enough. <laughs> you know, people often ask me, how do you compare this? Is this anything like other presidents? And the fact is, I've covered Democrats, I covered Carter, Clinton, Obama, I've covered Republicans, Reagan, both Bushes. I mean, it, it, we, and now Donald Trump. Donald Trump stands alone. He was not a politician. He was not in public policy. He didn't have a background in government of any kind. Uh, and he's brought this unique personality, his show business background, his reality TV background, his business background. He's a completely different kind of president. And we're all, you know, we've had to fasten our seatbelts. During this administration, the term fake news has become um, very commonplace. Um, disinformation, there's a lot of that going on out there. What challenges do those things present to you in terms of trying to do your job every day? There are enormous challenges that come with it because what has happened is it's now been planted in the minds of many Americans that they can't trust much of the news media. And it's not that the news media has ever been perfect and media reporters make mistakes, but not on a whole scale level and not uh, at, a, at, a, at a dimension that this president and others around him have, have portrayed. Um, we are, the reporters I know in Washington who cover the White House, who cover the, the Congress, by and large, are there to do their job. They're there to report the news, to get it across in as accurate a way as possible. And so this now new charge that's flying around every day where people say, well, we don't know whether we can believe you or not, has put all of us on the defensive, and I think needlessly so, but we have to now take that into consideration. We are now called on more than ever to be accurate, to make sure we provide context, accurate context, that we don't make any mistakes, um, because our credibility in the end is all we have. I know we at the News Hour take that very seriously. And you and the late Gwen Ifill uh, became the first all-female network yeah. anchor team in 2013. And, and we were so fortunate to have Gwen Ifill here just a couple of years ago. We all miss her. If, if you could take us back to that moment, what was that like, though, when that announcement was made? It was such a milestone for women journalists like, like me. Well, I, I mean, absolutely. Gwen and I had to look at each other and practically pinch ourselves because we were part of history. Good evening. I'm Judy Woodruff. And I'm Gwen Eiffel. We were the first two women to anchor together a national news broadcast. It was both a natural thing to happen and it was a remarkable thing to happen to have two women sitting there night after night mm -hmm. and it was just an enormous privilege for me. I mean Gwen was just is is somebody who will live forever. I think in the uh, her legacy will live on forever in news. She was not only a great journalist, she was a remarkable friend, larger than life personality, which I yes, know you saw. Great sense of humor. We miss her every day. And one of the reasons we are determined now to work so hard to do a good job at the news hour and to make sure uh, we, you know, that we are holding ourselves accountable is to live up to Gwen's legacy. We now have the Me Too movement sweeping the country. Um, you've been doing news for more than four decades as a woman journalist. What has that been like? Have things changed? I hope so, Twee. I certainly hope so. I, like every other woman I think I know in our business, and frankly, working woman, has had some kind of an experience with sexual har harassment, with uh, being treated differently because we're women, and yet those of us who are doing it have persevered. Now, we finally have gotten to a place where what happened was so egregious, starting with the Harvey Weinstein revelations, yeah. and then it swept across the news industry. And we now know many of the men I knew in-, in Including in Charlie news, Rose of PBS. Including Charlie Matt Rose Lauer, and others. NBC. In NBC. I think it's a turning point. because Why? Because I think enough women have come together and said, we've had enough. This is it. We're going to support each other from now on. We're not going to feel like we have to be quiet. I've now, I've just recently joined the Board of Advisors of a group called Press Forward mm -hmm. that's going to look and make sure that in newsrooms uh, across the country and, and for young women journalists coming along that they know that we have their backs and that no longer is this going to be tolerated. 
And speaking of women journalists, you graduated from Duke University with a political science degree. Okay. Did you always want to be a journalist or did you want to be a politician at some point? Well, I didn't necessarily want to be a politician, but I thought I would work in politics or public policy. Mm -hmm. uh, this was after thinking I was going to go into math. And uh, that's a long story about how I got from math to political science. But I just uh, sort of fell into journalism. I had a professor who said, do you ever think about covering politics? Mm -hmm. And I did, and I've never looked back. I've loved every minute. I feel so fortunate. And in the modern news cycle now, partly due to social media, but partly just due to the digital landscape overall, is now more frenetic than ever. The chase for online clicks and um, the chase for ratings is more intense. How is news hours approach different from what everybody else is trying to do? It's important that people watch us, but what we don't do, Twee, is we don't worry about how many eyeballs at this minute and the next minute and the next minute, which is what our commercial uh, friends are doing. They have to worry about ratings. It's how they make their, uh, their, their, their money. living, their yeah. money. We have the great luxury, the great ability to sit there every morning and throughout the day and look at what are the most important stories of the day, what should we be covering, what do the American people need to know, in our humble opinion, and how can we best cover it? And that's how we make our, dis our decision about what to cover, not to be driven by the silly story of the moment or whatever is getting a lot of clicks, but to think about what matters here and what do we owe people uh, time and information to, co to cover. That's what our job is. And on a personal note, your oldest son, um, Jeffrey, was born with spina bifida. And if you wouldn't mind sharing with us what that personal journey has been like for you, and, and how has it changed the way you look at life and work? It's changed everything. I mean, he was our firstborn. We have three children. Jeffrey was born in 1981. He's now 36 years old. Born with spina bifida, something we had not even heard of. Fortunately, he had a fairly mild uh, form of spina bifida, but then Jeffrey was injured as a teenager and is now someone with significant disabilities. Mm -hmm. But what it's taught us, Twee, is that we have to treat people with disabilities as we do anyone else. They want a norm as normal a life as possible. They want to be contributing members of our society. And I think too often people look away from them or look at them and just sort of pat them on the mm -hmm. shoulder. Uh, they want to be treated like you and me. Thank you so much for sharing that. Judy Woodruff with the PBS NewsHour, thank you. Thank you, Twee. It's just been great to be here. And that will do it for us. You can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Thank you for joining us.